Welcome to the LA Real Estate Podcast on buying and selling real estate in Los Angeles. Joining me on the show today is Dave Robles from Think Real Estate. Today, we'll be talking about what's going on in the LA market. Dave and I will be doing a neighborhood spotlight on Glendale, and we'll also go through 10 ways to make your house feel more expensive when you sell. Hi, Dave. Thank you for joining me on the LA Real Estate Podcast. Sarah, I am so, so excited to be on your podcast. Thank you so much. Yay. So Dave and I have known each other for almost five years, I would say. Uh, When I first became an agent, Dave taught a new agent class for um, every Monday morning. And I would go and you were extremely inspiring and wonderful and a fabulous teacher. Well, thank you. But I remember five minutes after meeting you thinking, okay, this is going to be a rock star. Sarah has what it takes to be a rock star realtor. Aw, thanks, Dave. Um, So something kind of funny happened this morning when I was, uh, I was, oh, I'm going to get a ton of stuff done before I record this podcast, dropped my kids off at school, got home, sat down, opened my computer. And then I remembered that my kids had a field trip today and you were supposed to bring a packed lunch and I forgot. (laughs) So I had to back them a lunch and go back to the school for the second time and then race home and then race here. Oh, just a normal morning in in mom world. And you have two kids, right? How old are they now? Oh my gosh, 15 and 18. Oh my gosh. And your daughter is basically a published author already? She is. In fact, she is a sophomore in college at 15. Are you serious? Dead serious, yeah. That's incredible. Wow. Yeah. And my son's looking at music schools and it's going to be a crazy year next year. Oh, that's so awesome. All right. Well, let's uh, get into some real estate. Here we go. Dave, I, I'm so excited that you're here on the show because I know you have been a realtor for a very long time. How long have you been in the business? Oh, my gosh. What year are we? 27 years now. 27 yeah. years. Yeah. So you must have seen some insane changes. It's been an incredible change in L.A. Um, When I started 27 years ago in Silver Lake, and I grew up in Silver Lake, and I started selling real estate in Los Feliz, you didn't venture, like, east of the 405 freeway if you were a West Sider. I mean, Silver Lake was the hood 27 years ago. It It was pretty amazing. A lot of gangs, a lot of violence, drugs. Totally, totally. And it was, you know, it was a very bohemian neighborhood. It was very artistic. And it was the art artist and actually the gay community that moved into Silver Lake in the 80s and revitalized it. Um, but it was a very organic gentrification um, that took place in the in the early 80s that led to what it is today. And it's so funny to think of Silver Lake now. I mean, Silver Lake, Ivanhoe, one of the best schools in L.A., um, incredibly hard to get into if you're not in the district. And I know their test scores are very high. I know the parent body is very affluent. Um, so that's completely transformed. When I first moved here, I was a nanny for a very sweet family in Silver Lake. And they told me when they bought years and years and years ago, same thing. It was a really rough part of town and that's all they could afford at the time. Oh yeah, totally, totally. My, and, my parents bought a house or my grandparents bought a house in Silver Lake in like 1948. And then what about just even the process of finding listings? I mean, there was no internet, right? Oh, my gosh. I want to hear about this. How did you know about the houses every week that came out? Okay. There was this MLS book that came out every two weeks, and there was one copy at the, at the real estate office, and you would go and take photocopies of the pages you wanted. There was no internet, so buyers didn't know of any other houses on the market except for what they maybe read in uh, the LA Times. And, but that was it. So they saw the houses that you showed them. There, were, there was no other way for them to see houses. And I'm sure all the contracts were probably handwritten on the back of a car, having yep. hand signatures. Yep, that's how we did it. It's interesting. You know, in a lot of ways, well, I think this is actually also the same for music industry, that people almost in a way have too much information now, and a lot of people find it so overwhelming. Ooh, that's a really good point. You know, they did a really quick, funny story, but they did this study where I think it was like a Trader Joe's or someplace where they gave people three jellies to choose from. You would taste the jelly and you would buy one because you liked one. So they decided, well, let's give them like seven choices. 
and they would taste all seven choices and sales went down. They didn't sell as much sale because people had too much. They were confused. It's too much to choose from. It's too much information. Totally. Yeah. I feel I feel like that, especially with all these um, platforms online. You know, you have the Zillow and the Truly and the Redfin. All of the sites are telling people the values of their house are different. You know, Redfin and Truly estimates could be hundreds of thousands of dollars different. And then you have a gazillion houses to see in a gazillion different parts of the neighborhood. So I do find, especially when people first start, it's a little bit stressful because there is too much to choose from. So that's why working with a realtor is important because you can actually help your clients focus on on their list, you know, right. the most important things to them, sort of narrow their focus down and help weed through the inventory so that it's not so overwhelming. Um, I don't know about you, but I'd rather show three incredibly suited houses for my clients than show them 40 things where only, you know, two of those will actually work for their needs. Right, right. Or we've all done that. We've all had it happen where you, the, the house you show them first is the best house, but they have nothing to compare it to. Right. And then they have to see like 10 other houses and that first one's gone. One thing I will say, though, that the Internet has allowed is I think it has made it easier for people to discover new neighborhoods. That's true. You know, and, and I think back in the old days, pre-internet, you kind of just knew of the neighborhood you were interested in. And today it's easy to discover. That's Yeah, that's very true. And, and even just to research things in the area. It's so funny to think back to before internet. You know, where's the best restaurant? You would have to just drive around and find. You couldn't just look on your phone and yelp it. No, no, you couldn't. I mean, there was the LA Weekly, which was like the Bible if you lived in LA, and that's where you found out what you know who, what bands were playing, what in, what restaurants were having stuff going on. That that was the Bible. And now, as a real estate agent, so you've been in LA the entire time. Yes. Right, doing real estate. Um, what do you think, as far as changes in the city as a whole? Do you are there areas now that you think are not as good investments? Are there some little pockets that you think are incredibly good for first time home buyers? Yes, definitely. I think um, like neighborhoods like Lincoln Heights, I think are going to be really hot. Alhambra, I think is a really great place to look. Um, I like Sunland. I like Tahunga. I think those areas are are undervalued, and I think there's a lot of room up there to grow. That's true. I've had a couple clients buy up there and they really like it. The thing about that area is I find with much of L.A., it's very block to block. So you could have a great street and then two streets away, not so great. I mean, it really comes down to your neighbors. Oh, totally. You know, if you have a neighbor who's storing 15 cars and there's trash everywhere and maybe not you don't want to live next to him. But if you have a great street with great neighbors, you know, any area really can work. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And before that, you even have like uh, Glendale, which is a big giant city between Silver Lake and, and La Crescenta or Tonga. Right. And you are a Glendale specialist. So we're going to be talking about Glendale a little bit later because um, I want to hear all about your experience with Glendale. Now, as far as sellers, so you've seen a ton of shifts in the market. You have seen, you know, 2008 when there was a ton of foreclosures and the housing crisis happened. Um, as far as selling, we're still, I feel, in a very seller-heavy market. Um, how do you feel? Do you think that's going to change? What are your instincts on what's coming up? Because we've all heard that there's going to be a shift in the market next year. So far, I haven't seen much, um, but I think it's also, you know, anything under a million dollars, there's just no, very little inventory in the areas that I work in. Right. There is going to be a shift because there always is. Um, we're going to be, hit a recession because the economy will eventually have uh, a recession, which is, I may think, negative GDP for two consecutive quarters. So that's the official what a recession is. That does not mean prices are going to go down. It does not mean it's going to affect the housing market like it did in 2008. That was a financial meltdown. That was not a normal recession. So I don't think we're going to see that again. So we may not even see prices drop much or an immeasurable amount, especially in the under million dollar uh, price range. Um, But we might see a slowdown and that's called volume. So let's say if you have a neighborhood where there's 100 sales a year, 
maybe we'll see 80 sales a year. But that doesn't necessarily mean the prices will come down quite as much. It just means we might see less sales. And then when you have seen, so I actually read, I, I don't know 100% if this is true, but I read that in other recessions, houses, house prices actually, sorry, house prices actually increased a little during the other recessions. Correct. In the last six recessions, prices only came down in two of them. So in the other four, prices stayed or increased. So it does not mean a price drop drop at all. And we've spoken a bit on the podcast before about what happened in 2008. And there was, you know, it really was a perfect storm of a lot of things. A lot of people had very bad loans with adjustable rates. Um, a lot of people lost work, so they couldn't. They were told, oh, you know what? Don't worry, because you're going to have so much equity in your house. If the rates go up, you can refinance. And then, of course, if you lose your job, you can't refinance. So, um, yeah, people had very bad loans, and it just it was a snowball effect of a lot of different things in the economy, the housing market. Um, but almost all of my clients now are locking in at 30-year loans, and the thing with that is, as we see in L.A., we have a crazy amount. Rents are crazy in L.A. They're extremely high. And when you have a 30-year mortgage, the only thing that's increasing a little is your property tax, maybe your insurance. Um, but you're, if you lock in at a rate, then your payment isn't going to jump a huge amount as, as a rent would. Oh, and you're totally. also paying down on your loan. Totally. Yeah, if you can keep your payment, you know, for 10 years later... You look back at your payment, it's like it's cake. It's easy to make that payment now, whereas the guy who's been paying rent for 15 years is probably having trouble keeping up with that rent, especially if he's in a house and it's not a rent-controlled situation. I've also heard there's a study that says there's going to be another million people moving to L.A. in the next 10 years. Wow. And there is just no way that building can keep up with it. I'm seeing a little bit more building right now, but... I don't see a lot of it because I feel like it's incredibly expensive and it takes so long. Um, are you seeing much in, in your area in Glendale? As far as building? Mm -hmm. They built a ton of stuff in Glendale and it was all apartment buildings. They built a, some really high end and a lot of them apartment buildings in downtown Glendale, which people have mixed opinions about. But I think they're actually in a weird way good for the housing market because people are renting these expensive apartments for like a year and then deciding, well, we can be buying a house for this this rent. Right. And they buy a house in Glendale. So that's, I think, helpful. So, yeah, well, unless we get a bunch of inventory soon, I don't think our L.A. market is going to have a huge amount of inventory. The one thing, though, that I think might add inventory is, I don't know if you've heard, I'm sure you have, that Airbnb rules are changing. Yes. And I think a lot of people had a, an additional property or a multi-unit that they were airbnb even though technically you're not supposed to Airbnb um, multi-units, but a lot of people were doing it because I don't think there was enforcement. So I've had some calls lately from people with multi-units considering selling because they can't Airbnb them anymore. Right. I, I read a really interesting article, too, and in that something that we're not even thinking about is going to really affect housing, and it's... It's the driverless automobile. Oh, interesting. I know. It blew my mind. Like, because people will be driving or, or riding in cars that they don't have to drive, they'll be willing to live further away. Do longer commutes. Be okay with a longer commute because they could be productive in their car as they're being driven to work. Wow. I mean, that's way out there kind of thinking, but that would make like buying in the Inland Empire not as bad if you have to commute to LA. I just had a conversation with a client. I was in her Tesla the other night and she commutes three days a week to the West side. And I said, oh, that must be really soul crushing. She said, no, I have a self-driving car. Yeah. I watch movies. Yeah. To me, it makes me a little nervous, to I know, be right? honest, but the technology is there. So uh, pretty amazing. All right. We'll be right back with a seller's tip. Here's a seller's tip. If you are selling your house and not living in it, it's a good idea to keep a radio on in the house so nobody knows that the house is empty and no one is home. Okay, Dave. So this is, I bet, your favorite topic. Glendale. Spotlight on Glendale. <laughs> you're, the, you're the king of Glendale. Oh, my God. How did that happen? I'm a Silver Lake guy. I grew up in Silver Lake. You oh have sold so many houses in Glendale. You've represented a lot of buyers in Glendale. 
So um, first of all, for anyone listening that doesn't know Glendale very well, could you sort of give us an idea of d- the different parts of Glendale? Totally. You know, it's funny because when people think of Glendale, the first thing that enters their mind is the Glendale Galleria. So we will forever be connected to a 1970s mall um, and that's what people's familiarity with Glendale is. It does have the dancing fountain, though. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> My kids love that thing. Anyway, so, sorry. Go on. Yeah, it's it's just hysterical that that's what we're known for. And the Glendale Galleria. And now, of course, next door, we've got the Americana, which is cool and people love it. But Glendale, A, we, people need to know it's not a neighborhood. Glendale is a is a freaking city. It's 200,000 people. It's a giant city in the state of California. And within it are some really cool neighborhoods that people aren't aware of because all they think about is the area right around the Glendale Galleria. Which is where our producer CP lives, by the way. In Glendale? Or yeah, he at, lives right by the at Galleria. At the Glendale Galleria? He's Not in, actually <laughs> directly inside of it, but he lives very close by. Cool. <laughs> so so Glendale, um, you know, it's got, let's start at the bottom. You've got um, Adams Hill, which is, you know, a, a great little hilly neighborhood, very similar to Glassell Park. In fact, it's right next door to Glassell Park. Um, I love Adams Hill, and I, I know, had a right? client just open escrow on an amazing property in Adams Hill just a couple days ago. Well, to keep just so we have some perspective, the av- average price per square foot in Adams Hill is four hundred and forty three dollars a square foot. It's a good first time home buyer. Totally. Price. Okay, Silver Lake seven hundred and fifty dollars a square wow. foot. Highland Park, a thousand five hundred and fifty dollars a square foot. Yeah, right. For some, some of the smaller houses are, up, yeah, crazy. Totally, totally. So Adams Hill, you're looking at four hundred and forty three dollars a square foot. You've got awesome views, good old character homes, very Glass Hill Park like. Then if you go further north, above like the freeway, you get like um, Ross Moyne, which is where I live, and uh, amazing Spanish um, homes. Great, great uh, historic historic neighborhoods. Funny thing about about Glendale, you cannot have a front yard fence. Really, it is against the law. Really, yes, yes. So they want people to see their neighbors. Yes, that's nice. Actually. But it's actually beautiful because yeah. you're walking up the streets and you got all these really beautiful big trees and oak trees, and there's no front yard fences. In actually, front of all the I'm houses. thinking about that now, and you're right. I've mm-hmm. never noticed that before, but none of those houses have no. front fences. They do not. Huh. I know, right? It's great. I dig it. So that's one thing I love about it. And in Ross Moyne, we now have, like, there's a Whole Foods there, a Trader Joe's. You could walk to it. So there's Fish King. There's a little gastro pub called We're Pouring, and it's got all the things that like if you live in Silver Lake, you would really appreciate to have if you lived in Ross Point. Right. It's nice to be close to coffee and snacks. Totally. And totally. Absolutely. I had um, a client buy a house by the country club, the mm-hmm. Chevy Chase mm-hmm. Country Club. And I love that area as well because of these gorgeous mid-century modern houses. I mm-hmm. love the mid-century houses. Totally. And there's a huge uh, amount of them there. $478 a square foot is the average in Chevy Chase. That's shocking to me yeah. that it's less than Adams Hill. Yeah. I guess the houses are bigger there, though, so... No, Adams Hill was 443 Chevy Chase is 478 It's a little bit more. Oh, Chevy Chase is yeah. a little tiny bit more. Yeah. Okay. But, but I mean, when you think that Highland Park is 550 mm-hmm. Silver Lake is 750 there's good value there. Really good value and really good schools. Parts of Glendale have really good schools. Not all of Glendale. So what are the best kind of areas for schools in Glendale? Good question. Um, you want to be in the Verdugo Woodlands, which has um, a great elementary school that's like an eight and a half, nine out of 10. Or, of course, if you go a little bit further north into um, La Crescenta, which is still part of Glendale, you've got amazing blue ribbon schools up there. Wow. I also find that uh, the Glendale police are pretty intense, which is great if you want a safe community. But I don't know if you're on their Facebook page. They're always do, posting things that they busted and crimes that they've stopped. And So I have a funny story about that. Okay, good. So when my, my wife and I moved into our home 17 years ago or so, it was 4th of July. And we're walking the kids in the neighborhood, strollers, you know. And there's all these police cars in the neighborhood, like a lot of them, like eight or nine cars. Wow. And we're like, oh, this is not good. Right. And so I'm walking up and I say, Mr. Officer, what's going on? He looks at me. Deadpan, he says, 
fireworks, illegal <laughs> fireworks. And I'm like, seriously? You got eight squad cars for Amazing. some fireworks? <laughs> and while the rest of the city is literally burning down. Not, not Glendale. Oh, my gosh. Glendale ain't burning down. <laughs> wow. But yeah, they were on it. They did not mess around. They did not mess around. I know that they're really, um, yeah, they're strict. I know people that have, a lot of people that have gotten pulled over in Glendale, speeding tickets in Glendale. That's, yeah, wow. Yeah, there are some differences between, like, also selling your home in Glendale versus selling a home in Los Angeles. It's interesting that in in Glendale, there's no city transfer tax. Oh. And in the city of Los Angeles, it's like $4.50 mm-hmm. cents per thousand. Mm-hmm. There's zero in Glendale. And that's all of Glendale. Mm-hmm. And then also, now I know this has recently changed, but the rent control laws were different in Glendale. Yeah, for a long time, we had no rent control in Glendale. But now, you know, rent control is a statewide issue. Right. And so, you know, it's it's every city, every municipality is going to have to deal with it in one way or another. They're going to have to take care of it. Another thing about Glendale. So the, the house that my clients bought um, close to Adams Hill, this is a different client than I'm in escrow with now. They bought an amazing character house that had not a garage, but a carriage house. Oh, love it's it. It's absolutely gorgeous. And um We did a lot of research during escrow. We talked to the historical society and we realized they're actually in a zone where they have to get paint colors approved, the exterior of the house. But that was exciting to them because they love the history of the house and they wanted to restore it, the exterior, instead of changing it. And they they just painted it and did some work and it looks gorgeous. The the, the history in Glendale and the way they protect their historic neighborhoods with the... um, um, HBOZ, HBOZ is there. Yeah. really on it. I mean, I, I sold a house up in um, Imperial that was a 4,000 square foot historically designated Spanish, and we sold it for two six. That house would have been three and a half million dollars in Silver Lake. Wow. You know, it all feel is all day long. Wow. And then tell me some of your favorite restaurants or hot spots in Glendale. Um, Fish King. Fish King is... Oh, I've been to Fish King. So good. (laughs) I mean, you can go, you can dine in, you can take out. It's good for catering. But you can get a really good fish meal there that's high-end restaurant quality for like 12 bucks. Wow. It's ridiculously good. Um, We have a coffee commissary now, which is kind of cool, over in Kenneth Village. We're pouring right on uh, Glen Oaks. is a great gastro pub. And I, I my, we walked in one day, and as we're walking in, we're thinking, oh, my God, there's no one in the parking lot. It's empty. And we open the door, and it's packed. Everybody walk there. Yes. Oh. Everybody walks. I'm like, oh, that's so cool. It's a walking neighborhood now. I do see a lot of people walking mm-hmm. in the evenings. I see a lot of just homeowners just going for a stroll and walking. And that's always nice, too, as far as safety and um, yeah, I really like Glendale. I've I've gotten to know it a little better over the last couple of years just with clients that were potentially priced out of other areas and we just happened to come along a house that suited their needs. And now that they've been living there for a while, they love it. Yeah, there's definitely a, a movement towards Glendale from people who are priced out of Silver Lake, Los Feliz, and, and are looking for a, a, a change and an alternative. It also seems like people that move to Glendale stay in Glendale for a very long time. Because a lot of the sellers were seniors that were moving out of state that my clients bought. I'm not seeing like a huge transfer of just people well, selling. Well, you bring up a good point. I mean, the turnover rate in at least my part of Glendale is 2%. Wow. That's ridiculously low. What would you say is kind of average? About 5% yeah, in most yeah, neighborhoods? Yeah, 5%. So people people stay because yeah, they, they love it. They do. Well, thanks, Dave. It's exciting to hear more about Glendale. If you don't know about Glendale, go for a cruise. Go to Fish King and have dinner. Check it out. Yeah, I'll buy you dinner. Yay! Here's a seller's tip. Change your air filters and service your heater and AC before selling. Also, change the batteries in your smoke detectors and change out any burnt out light bulbs. This is my biggest pet peeve. When I try and do photography or sell a house... And 30% of the light bulbs are dead. So please do us realtors a favor, change your light bulbs. Dave and I are going to tell you 10 ways to make your house feel more expensive so that you get more money when you sell. Dave, what's number one? Oh, number one's a no brainer. The highest ROI you can do for your house fresh paint. ROI, return on investment, fresh paint. It makes everything look bright. In the photos, I talk about this 
all the time when people look at photos, listing photos, they look on their phones and the photo is one inch high. So bright white, bright light paint makes a huge difference. Uh, number two, new grout and caulking around sinks, tubs, countertops, etc. This is a really inexpensive way that you can brighten up a bathroom or a kitchen without spending a lot of money. Uh, number three, Dave. Number three, change out any old electrical covers and with bright new ones. And that's so easy to do. You just go to Home Depot, get them, put them right over your switches, and you've got a nice clean look there. I think they're about 30 cents a piece or something. They're really inexpensive. And it does look much better in the photos. So that's something really simple you can do, um, which will make your house feel more expensive. Um, Really nice front door. This is really trendy right now is the bright yellow or teal door, but it does make a listing photo stand out. Yeah, totally. So that's something very inexpensive you can do. Okay, number five. This is for me a really, 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 really important thing is clean your house, clean everything clean and get professional cleaners because we are all busy and you probably don't have the time if you're packing up your whole life to scrub the toilets and the bathtub. And I mean deep clean. I mean scrubbing the tiles and do everything else. And yeah, it's, you can't say this enough. Cleaning, there's a new level of cleaning when you're putting your house on the market. I, I suggest having the windows professionally washed. I mean, it's, And it's very inexpensive. Totally. It's I think well it's a, it. maybe a few hundred dollars to do a whole house, which makes the photos look so much better. Yeah. When you're living in a house day in and day out for years and years, you're immune to its real feel and look. So clean and clean, clean. Number six. This is something that I think actually adds a very expensive feel, which is changing all the hardware out and the doorknobs and door handles. Uh, there's some trends right now. So the... the um, bronze look or the dark handles against white paint is very popular. Um, But that can transform your kitchen, your bathrooms, your house, just by changing out the hardware. And hardware you can get for not a lot of money. Uh, Lighting, number seven. You got to have the right lighting in your house. You know, I think people live in a house in a way that's convenient for them, but really how you want to show the house may not be in the convenient way. It's in the showy way. And your lighting is going to be an important part of that. So make sure your lighting is is right for the room. And if you don't have a really bright room, you can add lamps and you can have help with a stager, with your realtor for doing this. Another sort of pet peeve of mine is if there's a bunch of light bulbs in a ceiling, if you have um, recessed lights, but the bulbs are all different shades. It's not a lot of money. I would change them out and have them all be the same. And it's going to feel, again, more expensive. Oh, Dave, number eight. I know you're a fan of this. Staging. Staging. So with the houses that I've staged, I estimate that staging has brought at least forty to $50,000 more. Right on it. Right for every on sale. It. Totally. It just transforms your house. We've talked about this on the show many times before, but as an agent, I really, really, really believe in staging. And it is so hard to convince sellers to spend money to rent furniture in a house that they're going to sell. But it's all about the pictures and people buy a house based on a feeling. And staging gives people the feeling of that, not that they're in someone else's home, but, oh, my gosh, this could be my home. You know, you you make up a really good point there, Sarah, because we're really not selling the house. What we're really selling, Mr. Homeowner, is the lifestyle that your house is going to provide someone. So when you look at it that way, what's the lifestyle? And that's what we're going to be actually selling. And staging is a really big part of it. Uh, New rugs. Okay, this is another thing that's not very expensive, Um, getting new rugs. So if you do have hardwood floor that's a little scratched up, you know, you can put a rug down. Um, But if you have old rugs, they tend to hold smells in. And as we say, a smelly house is not a selly house. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. (laughs) So just get rid of rugs. You can get amazing, inexpensive rugs at Costco. Even Target has them. If you have a room that you just want to anchor the furniture, so for example, a living room, or you want to anchor the bed in a bedroom just to make it feel like its own space, an inexpensive rug goes a long way. Uh, Number 10, clean light fixtures, change all bulbs. That was one of my tips. Yeah, it was, right? It was a tip, but please change the clean the light fixtures. That's something that people always forget. 
is they'll clean the house, but they'll forget about their chandelier, their lamp. And to make it feel more expensive, everything has to be clean. Can I add one for the outside? Yes. Wood chips, okay? Your flower bed, you got your roses and you got the dirt between the two rose plants. No, just throw in some wood chips. It tidies it up. It brings it all together. It goes a long way. And mulch. Maybe, maybe, yeah, mulch. Mulch it totally. up. Totally. Mulch. Super easy, cheap, big bang for your buck. And what about like power washing the, the outside? Ah, good tip. Power washing the exterior. That's yeah. a really good tip. So if you listen to all the things that Dave and I told you to do and you do them, your house is going to feel a lot more expensive when you go to sell and you'll get the most amount of money, which is really the goal. Well, that was a great time. Thank you so much for listening to the LA Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Skelton. Dave, thank you so much for being in the studio with me. This has been a lot of fun. Dave Robles from Think LA. Um, In the podcast notes, we'll have the information for how to get a hold of Dave, how to get a hold of me. Uh, You can follow us both on social media. And Dave, thanks. Thanks for coming Sarah, in. Sarah, it's been such a pleasure. I was so excited to come here. I even dressed up. I wore this nice blazer and I'm thinking, I'm so vain. I dressed up for a podcast. And if you want to see what his blazer looks like, <laughs> you can go to our social media because we'll post pictures. Go. Oh, my God. Thanks for coming in, Dave. Thanks, Sarah.